So thank you very much for the invitation, thank you for the prize and thank you for the Laudatio. Actually, I have to say that um, um, somehow it's a very strange situation because Mario was the referee of my PhD, so I have the impression to be back <laughs> 20 years or maybe even more <laughs> ago. <laughs> and I will uh, talk about uh, almost the same thing because uh, as uh, Mario uh, uh, told you, uh, this is a very... Uh, difficult subject and so even though we are we, we have been able to prove uh, uh, some small results there is still a lot of things to be done so I think uh, it's uh, very nice and um, and uh, yeah still a very open problem so I didn't know exactly who would be uh, the audience of this talk so I'm sorry for and I apologize to all of you that uh, who already uh, know quite a lot about this uh, Hilbert's problem, but uh, I feel like uh, important to go back to try to explain exactly what it is. And so, yeah, I will uh, start uh, really from um, uh, the beginning, okay? So I will try to explain uh, the problem and maybe at the end I will uh, uh, show you some more recent results. So sorry for all of you who already know all, all this. Okay, so this uh, problem of, uh, uh, the sixth problem of Hilbert, as uh, Mario told you, is, is not a precise statement that you should prove, but rather uh, uh, a whole field of research. And uh, the, the question is to understand how you can go from models, say, describing atoms to fluids. Essentially, that's the, and here you have the, the precise statement of this, so one sentence in this problem. And you see that uh, this, uh, so the, the question is clear. You would like to understand how you go to, from the atomistic view to the laws of motion of continua. So essentially in the case of fluid, because else it's even more complicated probably. And uh, actually there is part of the solution in the, in the statement because, uh, uh, okay, it's very small, right? Okay. Okay. No, no, okay. <laughs> okay, so part of the, the answer, so at least uh, the suggestion of Hilbert is to use the, the Boltzmann equation as an intermediate uh, description between uh, this atomistic view and uh, fluid equations. Okay, so I will try to explain all of all these uh, different uh, words and all these different models. So starting from the atomistic uh, view. Okay, so we will see that actually we will restrict or focus on a very simple model. Okay, you can imagine a lot of different microscopic dynamics, but say, as even in this very simple case, we don't really understand. I think it's, it's <coughs> good to just have this simple case in mind. So you imagine that the gas of this, in this room is, is just a system consisting of a lot of different atoms. Okay, and what you know is that these atoms, they are, they are just interacting. And what you assume is that they don't see each other when they are far from each other, but they just collide, okay, like billiard balls. Okay, so that's really what we have in mind and what is written here with, uh, with some equation. So you see that this tells you that the derivative of the position is the velocity, which is just a definition actually of the velocity. And that the derivative of the velocity is zero, meaning that you have a, a rectilinear uniform motion until you uh, have a collision with another particle. Okay, so as long as the distance between two particles is uh, uh, larger than epsilon, then uh, essentially the particles are independent. And at some point when they collide, then you have a reflection. And this reflection here is assumed to be uh, uh, so pointwise in time and, and x and elastic, meaning that the, uh, the total kinetic energy will be preserved. Okay, so this is really, a, what if, if you are not familiar with this kind of models, this is just, just really like uh, billiard balls. So they, they touch each other and then they are reflected uh, depending on, on the uh, angle uh, where they, they, they touch each other. Okay, so that's, this, that's really a very, of course, if you have one or two or three or maybe even four balls like this, you can imagine that you put all these equations, which are really simple in a computer, and then just look at the dynamics and that's it. Okay? The problem is that the number of particles, the number of atoms in this room is so large that essentially even with a very, very big computer, 
uh, essentially you can you cannot predict anything from this model. Okay, so the model somehow is exact. Of course, it's not because the, the, the interaction between two atoms is more complicated than just, just uh, between two billiard balls. But even though you, you would be able to describe very precisely the motion of two or three atoms, the problem now is that the number of atoms is so large that essentially even you cannot say anything at the macroscopic level. Okay? And of course, you are not really interested in following each atom, but ra rather in knowing, uh, I don't know, the, the global motion of uh, the air if you open the door or something like this. Okay? So now if you would like to understand the, the motion of the air, if you, uh, for instance, uh, have some eating here and open the door, then uh, you expect that uh, the air will have a motion. But the, the way usually people uh, uh, describe this, this motion is by fluid equation. So fluid equation, of course, they, 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 they have been introduced quite a long time ago. Um, the idea is just to describe the, 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 the fluid with a couple of, of uh, say, macroscopic parameters. So, for instance, the density of the gas, okay, which is, uh, of course, different if the, the gas is uh, cold or um, hot. Uh, the, the typical velocity, the, the average velocity, the bulk velocity. Okay, so if you, for instance, look at, uh, uh, I don't know, water flowing in a river, then of course, uh, in, at each point, you can define uh, the velocity the, that you can observe. Okay, you can also uh, introduce the pressure, so a couple, of, or the temperature, so just a couple of, of, of uh, parameters, and these parameters, they only depend on time and position. Okay, and so this is what, what is called uh, an Eulerian uh, description, because Say, if you go back to this uh, example of the river, what you, are, what you do is that you are just localized at some point, and now you are just looking at the, uh, the, the water flowing at this point. Okay? So that this is different as being uh, like uh, floating with... Uh, an, an okay, so uh, say maybe the, the most famous equation of uh, fluid mechanics is uh, this uh, Navier-Stokes equation, which is written here. So here, uh, U is the velocity, Okay, and so you see that essentially this equation is nothing else than Newton's principle applied to, uh, to uh, the fluid. So here, uh, both these two terms here, they, they, they just uh, express the acceleration. But as you are in this uh, Eulerian description, of course, the, 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 you need to follow a particle to look at its acceleration. Okay, so this term here is just the acceleration. And you say that the, the acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces. And here I have two, two, two force. Uh, so one, which is the viscosity here, which essentially tells you how uh, viscous the fluid is, and a pressure. Okay, so essentially this is the forces, uh, this corresponds to the forces exerted by the other par water particles on a given uh, particle. Of course, a water particle is not just one atom, it's just a, it's a small volume where there are, there are a lot of atoms. Okay, so now what you would like to understand is how you can go from this model to this one. Okay, so from the atoms to the fluid. And you would like to know whether, say, of course, you see that this model here is, is much simpler because now you have a few parameters and you expect this uh, to be a, a much simpler description of the same thing, okay? And so, uh, of course, this is kind of simplification of the other one. And so what you would like to be able to say is in which regime, say, for which kind of parameters or physical uh, parameters, this is a good approximation of the microscopic dynamics. Okay, so that's, the, that's somehow the, the two uh, extreme uh, uh, models. But then you see that the, the, uh, the statement of Hilbert's problem suggests to introduce kind of intermediate description between the two. And this is, uh, this, this description, this statistical description actually uh, goes back to Boltzmann, so at the end of the uh, 19th century. And the idea is, is uh, as follows. So you still describe the, the, the gas as a big collection of particles, but instead of following each one of these particles, you are just counting the number of particles with a given velocity and a given position. Okay, so you see that, say, it, it looks like a little bit like the, 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 um, 
um, the fluid model in the sense that you look at a small say particle of fluid so a small volume and inside this volume you you are just counting the number of particles with a prescribed uh, velocity okay so you are just looking at the, the distribution of velocity inside this big particle of fluid okay so this the, now the, the the unknown in this uh, in this description is a function which depends on time and position like like in the microscopic description but also on the velocity okay so Actually, this, this, this description is much more precise than fluid mechanics. Okay? Essentially, what you expect is that you can retrieve fluid mechanics just by looking at average of this function f with respect to uh, the velocity. So typically, the, the average velocity of this big particle of fluid will be just the average of all the velocities of uh, the individual atoms inside this this. this so if you know that there are, I don't know, uh, three particles with velocity v1 and two particles with velocity v2, then essentially the, the average will be uh, 1 over th uh, 5 uh, times uh, 3 v1 plus 2 v2. Okay? But of course, it's, in general, this is more complicated that, than this. Okay, so now you would like to say that uh, this, all these particles, they, are, they, they, they essentially follow the same dynamics as I mentioned at the very beginning, so the billiard dynamics. Okay, and then you end up with an equation, which is uh, the Boltzmann equation, and so I will try to explain. So here, just forget about this right-hand side for the moment, so uh, if you have zero here, this uh, part of the equation tells you that uh, particles with velocity v will have this position, which is just shifted by v times dt during a time dt. Okay, so this, this is what is called the transport part, it tells you that in the absence of collision, each particle will move with its own velocity v, okay, which is something which is very uh, intuitive. Okay, and you can check that uh, then the density is just uh, translated by this. Uh, by, by this. Um. And now you, you need also to, to say something about the collisions, okay, and this is exactly what is done with this, this operator here. And um, so here you see that now if you have two particles, which at some point collide, then it's possible to create a new particle of velocity v just by collision of two particles with different velocity, which are uh, uh, denoted here by v prime and v prime one. So if you have two particles of velocity v prime and v prime one, maybe at some point they will collide, and you will have a new particle of, of velocity v. This doesn't mean that you have a new particle, but you see that you have kind of jump process in the space of all velocities, okay? And so uh, you end up with a new, so this means that this is what is called the Gain term, okay? So you have a new particle of velocity v just by this collision. And conversely, you can have less particle of velocity v because one particle of velocity v will collide with another one, then they are deflected, and if you just count the number of particles with velocity v, you have one less, okay? And so of course you have some, some constraints in order that two velocity can create a, a new particle of velocity v, okay? Uh, because you have this, that these uh, uh, collisions are el elastic, so you, know, you need that uh, v prime one and v prime, v prime are in some uh, on some uh, spheres, okay, with v uh, which is on this uh, say v prime v prime one has to be a diameter of the sphere uh, of a sphere where v is, okay. So this is a constraint, but essentially what you should just have in mind is that in this equation you have two parts, so the transport here, and you see that for the transport, particles are in any way, they are independent, okay? Each particle is transported independently of all the others. And now uh, this part here, and this part is quadratic because of course in order to have a collision, you need to have two, you have two, you need to have two particles, okay? So this collision term, because you have quadratic collision, then it's quadratic respect to F. But here you see, this is something which is, which is a bit like an approximation, because when you say that you have a, the probability of having uh, uh, two particles of velocity v prime and v prime one, which collide and, and, and somehow create a new particle of velocity v, you need to have both a particle of velocity v prime and a particle of velocity v prime one. But you, s you see that having both is not in general the product of having one thing and another thing. Okay, so that's really a, 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 basic, uh, a basic notion in probability that having two, uh, two joint events in general is not the probability of having each of these events uh, in a 
say, in independent way. Okay, so really, uh, I think it's important to see that in the Boltzmann equation, somehow where you, you have an approximation compared to the, the original system is just by assuming, and that this is, this is what is called the chaos assumption, that here, the probability of, of having two, two different things is like uh, these two, two events are independent. And this is, there is no reason that it's the case. Okay, so here this is already an approximation compared to the, the original model. Okay, so now uh, the, the, uh, you can rephrase somehow uh, Hilbert's problem like this. So you see that you have uh, these uh, three different ways of describing a priori the same gas. So the microscopic with the atoms, the macroscopic here with the fluid model, and uh, an intermediate st uh, uh, level where you uh, still use the, the atomistic description, so you still have a lot of particles, but now you are just looking at these particles, uh, say, uh, uh, in a statistical way. Okay, so and now you would like to be able to uh, relate all these, these different models. Okay, so now I will try to give you a little bit um, about the state of the art, and you will see that uh, there are still a lot of work to be uh, done. So uh, maybe it's good news because this means that uh, we still have a lot of things to be to, to do. But the first thing I would like to insist on is that actually this problem has already a very long, uh, a very long story. Actually, it's from the beginning when when when. Boltzmann uh, first uh, introduced this equation. It was already a big, uh, there was already a big controversy, okay? And I think it's important because this, somehow this controversy is still very present, maybe not in the mathematical community because somehow now everybody is, say, agrees on the way we should interpret things. But if you, uh, for, for instance, discuss with people in the um, philosophy of science or history of science, this is still a very uh, complicated uh, uh, issue. So I, I would like just to, to spend two minutes explaining this, this, this big controversy, which uh, actually goes back to Loschmidt. So if you look at the, um, the microscopic model, so the big billiard, okay, so it's really like a big billiard with, uh, I don't know, a lot of particles, then you see that it's really what we call an Hamiltonian system. So if at some point you decide to reverse all the velocities, then you will just go back, okay? And after the same time, you will just be back at the initial configuration. Okay, so we can say that the system is reversible in the sense that you can go uh, backward or forward, and essentially the dynamics is exactly the same. And the rules to evolve are exactly the same. Okay, you just change the velocity and then you go back. Okay, if you have a billiard collision like this, then the, 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 the particles are reflected like that. If at this point you just reverse the velocity, then you will just go back. Okay, now if you look at the, the, the description by the Boltzmann equation, that, that's, not, that's not at all the case because one very important uh, feature of this equation is that uh, you have this, what is called the H theorem, or uh, which is also called in physics the second principle of thermodynamics, which tells you that if you have a quantity, so it's the entropy for, for a mathematician, but the opposite of the entropy for, um, for, um, for a physicist. So this quantity is a Lyapunov functional in the sense that, um, that uh, this quantity for, will uh, decrease forever. Okay, so you start with a configuration which has an entropy, okay, so a quantity that you can compute in, in terms of the function f. Now you look at uh, the Boltzmann evolution, then this entropy will decrease forever. Once again, it's the, the mathematical entropy and it's the opposite of the physical entropy, which just increases forever, okay? So this means that if you uh, do the evolution, so the entropy will uh, be just decreased, okay? Now you reverse all the velocities, the entropy is not changed, okay? And so now if you uh, still evolve for the same amount of time, the entropy will still decrease and you still see that there is no reason, say, except if everything is conserved, and you see that you cannot reach the same, uh, the same configuration at, at the initial time. Okay, so this means that you, you see that th this very uh, simple thing that you exchange, you just change the velocity in their opposite. In one, in, in one model, you then go back to uh, the original configuration, and in the other model, you don't. 
Okay? So this means that somehow, somehow it's strange that you can describe the same system with these very different uh, uh, features. Okay? So this is, this is, of course, this is a paradox. And actually, this, this, this was more or less the reason why the Boltzmann equation was not uh, very well accepted at his time. Of course, uh, things have uh, changed. So now I will try to explain in which sense uh, what, what it means to be a good approximation. Okay? So um, uh, for this, I need two different ingredients. The first one is being a good approximation, of course, means that somehow something is close or is small. Or, so I need to uh, somehow quantify the fact that uh, so I need some small parameters okay? or large parameters. But I need the notion in, ma in mathematics, the notion of limits. Okay? Else I don't know what, is, what's, what a good approximation is. And then I will need another thing, which is uh, the distance in, in which I measure the fact to be close or not, not close. Okay, so I need two things in order to make sense of uh, a notion of good approximation, whether the two models are close to each other or not, which are a small, say, small parameters. Okay, and, and uh, so here, uh, of course, uh, the, the way mathematicians uh, play with the parameters is not always very um, nice because we forget about um, you know, uh, units and so on, but uh, I will try to, to be a bit... Um, rigorous about this. And then I will try to explain, uh, say, uh, the notion of convergence, which is the same as topology or as the distance in which I measure uh, the, the approximation. Okay, so for the first limit here, so to go from particles to uh, the Boltzmann, uh, the Boltzmann uh, uh, equation, you see that uh, the, the, the most important assumption in the Boltzmann equation was this, this, this assumption that having two different, say, having a joint event that I have both the particles of velocity v prime and v prime one is the same as having the, say, the product of the probabilities. So it's a notion of independence, okay? And you see that this notion of independence or this notion of, of say, factorization or this notion of, so this is something that we, uh, no, we expect to be true in the limit where, when you have a lot of particles, okay? And so here, the, the, what is important, say, the, the, the small parameter will be the size of the particles. Of course, if you have a lot of particles in a finite volume, you need the particles to be small, either else uh, you have a problem, just a packing problem, which is a completely different problem. So here, I have very, very small uh, particles and I have a lot of them, okay? So here, Somehow, my small parameter will be, uh, will be uh, the size of the particle. So this will be my uh, epsilon. And then uh, we will see that essentially I have no choice if I would like essentially uh, the particles to, 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 to have essentially one collision per unit of time, then I have no choice for the number of particles. Okay, so that, that's what is called the boltzmann grad scaling. As I said, uh, we will see that this number of particles n has to be related to this size of particles, okay, in order that the mean free pass is constant. Now, if I would like to go from, from uh, this, this statistical model here, but which is still an ato atomistic uh, description, to fluid mechanics, you see that in order that I can describe the, the distribution of my particles by just a few parameters, somehow I, I need to, that locally, in my big volume of, uh, say, my, or my small volume of, of fluid, say, so it's, it's small in the sense that uh, it should be uh, still a, an infinitesimal volume for my, compared to my, my, the whole volume of my fluid, but it, it has to be, say, large enough in order that I have a lot of particles in order to be able to average or to make statistics, okay? So I look at this infinitesimal volume of, of fluid, and then I would like to be able to describe the, 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 the density of particles, so the F inside this volume, just by, by a few parameters. So the bulk velocity, the... So this means that I need to understand the, that, that the profile of the density inside this volume is fixed or depends only on, on, on this, say, bulk velocity, temperature, and density. Okay? So this means that somehow I, I need that locally uh, the gas is at local thermodynamic equilibrium. 
Okay? And so in order that you have this equilibrium, this means that you need to have a lot of collisions in order that somehow you, you, you get thermalization. And so you know the profile. Okay, so now the, 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 the small parameter here is what is called the Knudsen number. And it, it actually measures the ratio between, say, um, the, the, this mean free pass, so the, the typical distance that, you, uh, that a particle uh, travels between two collisions. So this mean free pass has to be really, really small compared to the typical length of observation. Okay, so this is really what you, what you expect is that this fluid approximation will be good if you are observing your gas at a, at a scale which is much bigger than the scale uh, where you have these collisions. So that you have a lot of collisions and then you have thermalization which is much faster than, than the, the, the slow motion of, uh, of, uh, of the fluid. Okay. So that's the, the first thing. So here you see that you have one small parameter here, which is the size of the particles. And this size has to be really, really small compared to the uh, mean free pass. And now you see that here you need that the mean free pass is very, very small compared to the uh, observation length. OK, so now you have three different lengths. And they have to be really uh, well separated. OK, and now uh, I have to explain a bit more about the notion of convergence. OK, so um, maybe um, uh, so maybe the first one is the most complicated. OK, because as I told you, um, essentially what, what I need to understand is why I can, re say, replace this joint probability by the product of the probability. OK, so what I need to understand is, is why have this factorization? Okay, and so this 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 kind of things is is related to the concentration of measure and to uh, the law of large numbers. Okay, and so this means that I will not have a convergence trajectory uh, by trajectory. Okay, I cannot expect to say that. Okay, I, I start with a with a system that where I know everything. I look at the microscopic dynamics, and if I look at one trajectory of one particle, then it will look like uh, the solution of the Boltzmann equation. This is completely wrong. Okay, the point is that you really have a lot of different possible behaviors, and this is this is related also to to maybe a more. Uh, uh, intuitive notion of chaos, so you have a lot of different things that could happen. And then what if, if you get the Boltzmann equation as an average of all possibilities. Okay, so that's really important because somehow you, you will never prove uh, that, that uh, it's a good approximation if you just take two trajectories and try to couple them. Okay, so that's the, for, for those of you who know mean field limits is the case. Okay, in mean field limits, you can prove that somehow you can replace your uh, actual trajectory but by something which is a bit uh, homogenized, okay, but the, the limit trajectory. And you can prove that they are really uh, uh, close to each other. Here it's completely different. You have a lot of trajectory, they do uh, things which are really completely different. But then you can uh, see that most of this trajectory, they concentrate around one trajectory, which is the, the trajectory which is predicted by the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so that's really different. It's really uh, something which happens only in probability. And so this means that the tools to, to, you, to, to look at this limit here are tools coming from probability theory. Okay? And so you see that if, if this convergence towards the Boltzmann equation is a kind of flow of large number, then you can, you can try to understand also uh, the fluctuation around this, 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 uh, this trajectory here. And, and so that this was mentioned by, by Mario. Then uh, you are interested in the fluctuation and also maybe in the probability to see something which is different from the, the, the trajectory predicted by the Boltzmann equation. And this is related to large deviation theory. Okay, so that's, that's really uh, the global picture of this limit here is that uh, you can obtain a lot of different things. Okay, and that's why essentially you lose reversibility because you will not follow one trajectory, but rather an, an average of many different things. Okay, and then of course when you average, then you lose, you lose, uh, you lose the reversibility. So just imagine, so just to 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 for you to have an intuition of this. Imagine that I tell you that uh, to, to go to Termini, okay, maybe Termini is a little bit too close, but uh, you need to uh, just uh, turn, uh, I don't know, uh, 
three times on the left and two times on the, on the right. Okay, and you have only this information. Okay, of course it's not enough to to be sure to reach Termini in a, in a finite time. Okay, you can explore a lot of different trajectories. Okay, and this this is really what happens here. And so there is no reason that if you then uh, try to do exactly the reverse uh, trajectory, so turning uh, I don't know uh, two on the left and three on the right, in general you will not go back. Okay, so you lose uh, reversibility because it's essentially you lose too many information to be able to go back. Okay, so now the, the other limit is a bit different because here there is no more notion of probability. If you start from the Boltzmann equation, somehow the probability is, say, the random variable is already encoded in this equation. So now you have just one equation, which is one PDE, and you would like to uh, look at the limit uh, of this uh, PDE when, uh, so in this, uh, which is a kind of singular perturbation problem, when the collision, uh, collision uh, term is much bigger than the transport. Okay, so now we have two scales. There's the scale of the collision, which is much faster than the scale of the transport. And then here you see that it will be completely different because you are, will have a, a, say a usual convergence. And essentially all the uh, error that you can have is related to the fact that you will forget about oscillations. So typically what you expect if you go to uh, some, some incompressible regime is that you will get a superposition. The solution should be the, uh, the superposition of, of your incompressible motion plus some acoustic waves. Okay? So typically what you expect is that if you are able to filter this acoustic wave, so these very fast oscillations, then this is, say, a uh, usual limit, usual convergence. Okay, and so the way you can just filter oscillation is just by looking at weak convergence, because weak convergence doesn't see oscillations. Okay, so that, I, I think it's really important to understand that these two limits are really uh, different, say, not only because the small parameters are different, but also because the kind of approximation that you are doing are different. Okay, so. So that's essentially the state of the art uh, right now. So to go from particles to the Boltzmann equation, so that was mentioned by, uh, uh, by Mayo, essentially you, you are able to do something only for a very short time. And when I say short time, it's maybe uh, ridiculous, but it's, uh, say, a fraction of the, the time for which you have, in, in average, one collision per particle. Okay, of course, as you have n particles, you have still a lot of collisions and especially you, you lose the reversibility and you have all these nice features and you can look at the large deviation and blah 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 so everything uh, like this but still the time is very very short and especially is shorter than the mean free time. Okay so this is the uh, very important result by, uh, by Lanford. Okay and I, I think I will not have time to discuss the, the method to get this result but essentially what you are doing is to try to understand how this, this you have say you can propagate chaos you can propagate the factorization and so you see uh, you first look at the probability of seeing one particle then it depends on the particle of seeing two particles joint part John probability of two particles, but then you write the equation for the John pro probability of two particles, but it will depend on the John probability of three particles and so on. So that's what is called the BBGK Y hierarchy. So you end up with a big, big system, which is almost infinite system of equation. And then you need to understand something from this system. Okay, so big, because you have this big system and it's very complicated, you end up with this short time restriction. Okay, of course it's seems to be only a technical uh, restriction, but say up to now I, I don't know any result except the result by uh, uh, Ilner, Cacignani and Pulvirenti, which tells you that if you start uh, with a gas where you have only a finite number of part say large but finite number of particles, but which can extend in the wood space, then you can reach a large time, but because essentially what you should uh, uh, have in mind is that you have all these particles that will interact at the beginning, but then because of dispersion, they will just uh, go uh, each different uh, in uh, different directions, and they will no more interact. Okay, so somehow even the, the proof is a little bit different. You see that you have the same spirit that essentially each particle will just uh, 
um, have a finite number of, of collision and then something different happens. Okay. So this, this is the, the set of the art. And you see that this time, once again, what you should remember, and it will be important for the sequel, is that the time for which you can justify the Boltzmann equation is shorter than uh, the mean free time. Okay. So now we, we you have this, this second limit here. Okay. And so you would like to go from the Boltzmann equation to a uh, fluid equation. So the first thing is that, of course, you have a lot of different fluid equations. So this means that you have to uh, not only to fix uh, the, f the fact that the mean free pass is small, but you need also to understand, say, in particular, to, to understand the, 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 the possible viscosity or compressibility of the gas, you need to fix other, uh, at least one other parameter. Okay, and so say, I will just focus on the case where you uh, go to the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation that I, I wrote at the very beginning. So in this case, actually you can prove everything. So everything in the, in the sense that you can prove that for uh, all times, if you start from a, a solution of the Boltzmann equation, very weak solution of the Boltzmann equation, which is defined globally in time, you look at the, the right scaling, so which is called the diffuse uh, uh, scaling, then you will go to a solution of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is also a weak solution, so a Loret solution, turbulent solution. You can also uh, look at the, the case where you add some boundary condition, and essentially you can, you can uh, see everything. So th that's the program which was, um, um, say, introduced by Bardos, Gulf, and Nevermore. And here you see that I'm discussing only very weak solution. So there are also um, uh, different approaches. Uh, for a, say, smoother solution, especially uh, the case where um, uh, you would like to look at uh, uh, stationary solution because then the, all this theory of uh, weak solution uh, does not exist. Okay, and so here there are a lot of people uh, wor working on this uh, on this uh, hydrodynamic limit with this different approach. Okay, but say, of course, there there are still a lot of, of problems. So, for instance understanding the compressibility, the compressible effects, understanding, uh, so there are still, uh, or the non-viscous case, so everything like this is still uh, very open, so there are still problems, but you see at least th there are situations where, where you can conclude something, okay, which is very, a very general situation. Okay, so now I would like to uh, be able to do this be because this, this was the original problem of Hilbert, just using this as an intermediate step, but the, the, the idea is really to go from here to here. Now you see that this limit here, I, I told you that the small parameter is the mean free pass or the mean free time. Okay, so this, this means that I would like to look at the, the, the system on a time which is much, much larger than the mean, mean free time. But the problem is that I'm able to justify the Boltzmann equation only on a fraction of this mean free time. So you see that I cannot just use the, the two, like uh, two pieces, and then conclude something here because I will just conclude something at time zero which is not very interesting. Evolution and equation at time zero is uh, almost like nothing. Okay, so really the problem to go from this microscopic to the macroscopic level here is, is, is here to understand why you can only reach a finite, say, a very small, actually, a very small time. Okay, so that's essentially the state of the art. I cannot uh, give you a lot of details about everything, but. Um, so maybe I uh, just say that yeah, the, 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 the case of uh, compressible fluid is, is really much more complicated because you expect to have singularities and this is something that uh, we don't really understand. Okay, so now I would like to just uh, give you um, a flavor of what, what say, we, are we can still do a little bit of something to go from here to here, just in the case where you are really close to an equilibrium. Okay, so it's not... Of course, it's not exactly what you would like to do. You would like to be able to understand uh, the, the case out of equilibrium, but say, at least uh, you, you, you can start with a little bit of something, okay? So this is, this is a series of work with, um, with uh, Sergio, who is here, and uh, Isabel and uh, Thierry. And so in this case, where we are really, really close to equilibrium, we can do the whole program. So I have uh, this arrow here, this arrow here, and this arrow here. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, the, the third line uh, is not consequence of the two because the state equation is different. 
I mean, if you pass from a microscopic model to hydrodynamics, yes. the hydrodynamics is not the same. No, you it will be the linearized. The linearized, everything will be linearized. Yeah, but the constants are, di are, are, are different. The state equation. The state equation is different. But it's the linearized version of the state equation. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not the. the no, <laughs> it's linearized. Everything is linearized. Yeah, sure. So here, say, as long as I just said that it's macroscopic, it, it will be a macroscopic equation. It will be a fluid equation. It will be a Fourier and a Stokes. See, but the local equilibrium is different. The local equilibrium in the second case is Gibbs. In the first case is Maxwell. So whatever you obtain is something physically different. Anyway. Uh, this maybe we should, should discuss because I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now what I, I'm looking at is, is just, so there is one, one case where, okay, everything is, is very nice. It's a case where nothing will move. Okay, it's not very interesting from the, from the physical point of view, but say the equilibrium, so here, you say that you start here with the distribution, which is the Gibbs measure that I will uh, uh, write just after, afterwards. Okay, then you get a particular solution of the Boltzmann equation, which is an equilibrium, which is a global equilibrium, so it's uh, Maxwellian uh, or Gaussian, with parameters which do not depend on T and do not depend on X. Okay, so it's a profile in V, which is uh, just a Gaussian, and with parameters which do not depend on anything neither t nor um, x. Okay, so then it's a very uh, nice solution. And of course, you can go here and here what you get is that the temperature is constant and uniform, that the density is constant and uniform and that the velocity is zero. Okay, so of course, it's not very interesting, but at least in this case, you have all the arrows. Okay, everything is nice. Okay, of course, this, this is not exactly what you would like to understand, but, but okay. So this is exactly what you have here. So this is, uh, say, uh, the probability measure on uh, your, uh, your, uh, at the level of your atoms. Okay, so here you see that, you say that each atom here is distributed, so uh, it's distributed according to a Gaussian in velocity, okay? And uh, so you don't, so you don't know either the, 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 say the total number of atoms, n is also a, a random variable here. So here you see that it looks like the Poisson law for this uh, number of atoms. Okay, so mu epsilon is the average number of atoms in my gas. Okay, if I look just at this, this tells you that you have a Poisson law for this number n. Okay, once this n is fixed, then you say that each one of these atoms is distributed uniformly in space and with this Gaussian profile in V, okay? And uh, then you just assume that uh, you have uh, no overlap between the particles, okay? And then you can prove that this is an equilibrium measure, so it's an invariant measure, it's invariant under the flow of uh, this, this, uh, this Hamiltonian dynamics, okay? Under this billiard flow, okay? So this, this, this is a, an equilibrium, okay? So you, you should really think that an equilibrium here is not one given distribution. It's not that I fix the position and the velocity of all atoms, and this would be uh, conserved. Okay, but this is really a, a law, a probability law on all these atoms, and this probability law is conserved by the dynamics, which is different. Okay, so that's really uh, already a probability. Okay. And this, this is uh, just uh, the, the profile for each. Okay, so this is, this is uh, the, the solution that I mentioned just before. And if you look at this and you look at the, this property of concentration, then you get that the, the average low for this is the, just this Gaussian here. And this Gaussian here is a stationary solution of the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so that's the equilibrium situation. Okay, once you uh, have said this, it's not very interesting because, okay, and so what? So now what we would like to do is to uh, just modify a little bit this and say, okay, now I will start not exactly with this distribution, with, but with a small fluctuation around this, okay? So that's what we are looking at. So what we are interested in now is say, our uh, random variable that we uh, would like to study is this empirical measure. So the empirical measure is just uh, the average, say, the, you just uh, 
take uh, your, uh, your gas, uh, just put a direct mass for each uh, atom with its position and its velocity, and then you, you create a measure, of course, uh, by, uh, with this normalization. You see that if mu epsilon was fixed, so in the, the canonical setting, if mu, mu epsilon is not given by Poisson law, but it's just fixed like n, you see that it's a measure with probability measure. Okay, so this just tells you how the, how the particles are distributed in the phase space. Okay, so now what I said the, um, you see that this, that this measure that I look at at the beginning, so the Gibbs measure, which is written here, okay? So if I look at this empirical measure, and I, I look at how it behaves under this, this, um, this uh, Gibbs measure, you can see that when uh, this parameter mu epsilon goes to infinity, so if you have a lot of particles, then essentially you can prove that the empirical measure just behaves like this, this, this M of B. Okay, so you see that, um, I think it's important to see that you have concentration. So, okay, you can have a lot of different empirical measures that you can choose essentially your distribution at the beginning, uh, whatever you, you want, okay? But under this, this probability measure, then essentially what you see almost surely, okay, is, is this Gaussian, okay? If you say, uh, pick uh, a particle at random or just pick the average, then what you see in average is this uh, nice profile, okay? Okay, so this, this is really uh, the, the level of the, um, the, level of, of the law of large number. And so that, then uh, what you can try to see is, is the fluctuation around this, this law of large number. Okay, so you say, okay, I have a distribution of random variable. I know that in average it concentrates on something, but now I can try to see the next order. And you know this for, uh, if you uh, imagine that you have, a, say, a, a series of random variable that, and you, you know uh, they are uh, they're low, what you expect is that in average, if you pick uh, n, uh, n random variable under the same law, then you expect to just to converge to, to the law, okay? But then you see that at the next order, this is what is called the central limit theorem, you can say also something about the, the, the fluctuation. Okay, so here this is exactly what I would like to do. So you see that my random variable here is this, this empirical measure. I remove the expectation, and the expectation actually will be essentially uh, this, this part here, okay? I remove the expectation, and then I rescale. Of course, if I just uh, remove the expectation and ju just look at the convergence, then the law of large number tells me that this will converge to zero. This is not really important. Now I rescale because uh, this mu is a very large parameter. And now I will try to, to look at the, the... So if the fluctuations are indeed of the order of one over square root of mu epsilon, then you see that this, this thing should converge to something. Okay, but you see that there is something which is really different. At the level of, of the law of large number, you, co you converge to something which is a deterministic, uh, a deterministic um, variable or deterministic limit. Now, if you look at this fluctuation, okay, we will see that it, re it will remain something of the order of one, but it will converge to something which, which has still some randomness. Okay, so that's really different. The, the, the law of large number tells you that you have a deterministic limit. Now, if you look at the fluctuation around this deterministic limit, of course, you know that in average it should be zero, okay? And, and then you, you get something which is a bit of randomness. Okay, so what uh, we have been able to prove is this, um, is this kind of central limit theorem. And actually, it's old for all time, okay? So it's global, global in time. And actually, I, I will uh, um, uh, comment on this uh, later on. But it's also true for times diverging slowly towards infinity. So, so that's why we will be able to just put this and put the, the hydrodynamic limit uh, stuff and then get the, the whole uh, picture. <coughs> okay, so here you see that the dynamics is always the same. So it's always the billiard. Okay, so I don't change anything at the microscopic level. The only thing that I do is that I look at a, particle, at a particular uh, initial distribution. Okay. So my, my, my distribution at the very beginning is this, is this uh, Gibbs measure, okay? And now I, I look at what happens under this Gibbs measure. So I said that 
okay, the law of large number is not very interesting because we know it's just something which is a stationary solution. But now the fluctuation field that I just uh, defined, it will converge in low, so it's really a random variable and it tells you that you only know the, the law of this random variable. To the solution of a, a rather complicated equation, maybe I will not uh, uh, give all the details, but it's a random variable, so it has a deterministic part here, which is just a linearized version of the Boltzmann equation. So you take the Boltzmann equation and just replace the, the, the quadratic term by the, its linearization around the global equilibrium. Okay, And then you see that because th then you have this small correction here, which is a noise. Okay, And the noise is of the order of one. Okay, So now you see that you really have a random variable Say so at the beginning, it's a, a very nice uh, initial datum. And then you have really a dynamical noise, OK? Which is, so you have here, because, because of this specific choice, I've, I still have a little bit of noise at time 0. But, but you see that you also have a dynamical noise, OK? So somehow the, the part of the, the randomness of the initial state will be transformed in some dynamical noise. So really. You, you see that you, you, you see in this result the transformation of the initial randomness through the dynamics into something which is a dynamical randomness. Okay, so um, uh, just of course uh, it's not very precise because I, I uh, don't really define here the noise. Maybe what I can say is that uh, essentially the noise, since it's a Gaussian noise, it's essentially completely determined by its covariance. And its covariance, you can get it, say, in a formal way just by using some fluctuation dissipation argument. So as you are at equilibrium, this part here, which is uh, the Boltzmann equation, is dissipative. Okay, we saw that, uh, that you have dissipation of, uh, so here, of the L2 norm. And this part here, say, some, somehow introduce the fluctuation. And because you are at equilibrium, the fluctuation should ex exactly equilibrate uh, the dissipation. Okay, so this is the way you can, say, just guess the covariance here, even though you are not able to prove this. Okay? And the other remark is that you can um, uh, prove actually this not only for all uh, finite time, but also for time which are going to infinity. But you see that, okay, for physicists, I think it's uh, very funny because if, even though epsilon is very small, when you take three logarithms, it's not, it's not very big. Okay? But still, it's diverging. I don't know how much time I'm, I don't have. Oh, Okay, still um, some minutes. Okay, so, <laughs> so now uh, here is the, the picture that we have. Okay, so here I still look at this uh, uh, microscopic dynamics. So once again, I, I did not change the microscopic dynamics. It's still the same dynamics, okay? What I change is what I, I, I measure on these dynamics. I start from an equilibrium distribution and now I look at the fluctuation of the trajectories under this, this specific distribution. Okay? So now I have an, an intermediate step here, which is the linearized Boltzmann equation, which has also a little bit of dynamical noise. And then I end up here with some equation that so I can, I can look at uh, the case where now I observe this system on a time which is much larger than the, the mean free time. And then what I, what I see is, uh, say, the linearized version of the Navier-Stokes equation. So now I get two equations, one which is the Stokes equation for the velocity and the Fourier equation for the temperature, so the fluctuation of temperature and the fluctuation of velocity, actually. And uh, actually, these, these are, I also catch with this, this, uh, this procedure, I also catch the, the, the fluctuations around this, this hydrodynamics. So, we get not only the, the fluid equation, but, but say the fluctuating uh, fluid equations. OK, so um, I think I have only a couple of minutes, so I'm not very sure what I can tell you. Maybe some, maybe not really arguments of the proof, but maybe some, just some, some remarks about this, this, um, this, <laughs> this proof. Um, and maybe I will just uh, talk about this. I think the other one are more, uh, yeah. So I will just uh, fi finish on, on this one. So um, the point which is really important here is that all the randomness, you see that my, my, my dynamics is completely um, uh, deterministic. Okay? Once I have fixed the initial position and velocities of all particles, then you can wait and nothing will 
say that there is no way you can deviate from your trajectory. Okay, so everything is deterministic. Okay, and so the only randomness in this in this problem comes from the initial data. Okay, so if you would like to be able to say something at uh, at a further time, then you need to to be able to pro propagate this randomness. Okay, and that's of course the very uh, hard thing in all this this uh, this question of low density limit and so on. Okay. So you would like to be able to understand the dynamics sufficiently well in order that you can propagate this, this factorization or randomness or whatever. Okay. But on the other end, it's very complicated to propagate anything just because essentially you don't understand anything about the dynamics. Okay. So maybe the, 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 the idea is to understand that, that each trajectory is very unstable. See that you start with two particles. Okay, so you wait a little bit, they will collide and blah, 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 okay, like this. Now you, st you start with the same particles, you just change a little bit, you see, uh, uh, the distance of the order of epsilon, the, 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 the position of this one, and maybe they will even not collide, or they will collide and then be deflected in a completely different direction. Okay, so this means that if you make an error of uh, something of the order of epsilon on the, on the, on the initial position, then just with one collision, you have something which is completely different. Okay? But now if you have two collisions, if you make an error of the order of epsilon square, you have the same problem after two collisions. And now if you have four collisions, then even an error of, of, of the size of epsilon to the cube is, is somehow really a problem. So you see that you have no rigidity in this in these trajectories, and so it's very difficult to propagate anything because essentially you have the dynamics, you, you don't understand anything about the dynamics, and still you need to propagate something. Okay? So I think it's, it's, really, um, it's really important to understand this, this, that this, this is really the, the problem in, in all this stuff. Okay? So the idea of Lanford is to, to say that essentially you can project the dynamics and somehow you can see only a finite number of particles. So if you see only a finite number of particles and you expect that you have only a finite number of collision, then maybe it's not such a big problem because, okay, you say at the very beginning, I, 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 I have a very uh, rigid description and then I can follow all the trajectories, okay? And then I can couple everything, okay? But in general, this is, this, is, this is not the case that you can project on a finite number of particles because there is no reason that you can do that, okay? So here, in the specific case where you are close to equilibrium, essentially what you are able to do, and that, that's the thing that you are not able to do in general, is to say, okay, the kind of dynamics for which at some point you have a lot of, of, of collisions and everything becomes completely crazy, this you can remove just because you have for all times, you know that you are distributed uh, uh, um, according to this Gibbs measure, okay? So, Really, you know the distribution of, of particles at each time, and you can somehow sample the time and say, okay, if at some point there is a problem, okay, and I focus on this problem, and I prove that this, this event is of very small probability. Okay, and it's really important here to be at equilibrium because you can essentially decouple everything and say, okay, now assume that uh, the, the dynamics becomes crazy because at time, I don't know, time two, there, there is a, a problem and uh, the particle number three uh, starts uh, uh, start, uh, seeing all the particles around it. Okay, then you can just focus on this very specific time because you use this invariance this time, uh, this time invariance of the measure, and say, okay, this, this I can remove, okay? And if you are able to remove all these very, very bad trajectories where you have, a, 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 say, an uncontrolled number of collisions, then essentially you are safe because, okay, the, 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 the dynamics is not very stable, but with a finite number of collisions, then it's not so bad, okay? So that's really important to see that the difference between this case and the general case is really the fact that you can control every pathological event by using this invariant measure, okay? And in general, this is not clear what you can do. So I think, uh, say, up to now, it's really completely open. I, I don't think that there is really uh, any idea in the air about uh, the way you can really control this, uh, this uh, pathological event. If you don't have an invariant measure, then you don't know. Maybe at some point you have this crazy thing, and then you lose control of everything. Okay, so you see that 
they are really, uh, uh, we are really missing a very uh, important idea to go further. The, the bad thing is that even the Boltzmann equation is, is not very, um, uh, very uh, nice equation when you start having a lot of collisions. So even at the limit, uh, this kind of concentration of pathological events may be a, a very uh, big problem. So this means that you really need to understand uh, uh, something different. Okay, I think I should stop here and I thank you very much for your attention.